All right. Good morning. Again, welcome to Cross Community Church. I'm really glad to be here. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to preach while our lead pastor, Jason, is away on that mission trip. And I just kind of had to bear with me this morning. I have a little bit, I'm a asthmatic in case you didn't know. And uh, just having some breathing. I'm going to breathe a lot. If I, if I sigh, if I breathe heavy in the mic, just, just be okay with that. I don't know what to tell you. So, um, but that's okay. We'll just get through it. But also, um, last service we had a power outage. If it happens, we're just rolling with it. No big deal. Um, the, the service will go on, uh, preaching will go on, and we're going to have a great day anyway. And I just kind of wanted to, to tell you, um, I, I'm just coming off a of vacation and uh, getting to preach here this morning, which, which at first I was kind of bummed about because a lot of times when you preach, if you've ever been in this position, it kind of weighs heavy on your mind as you prepare uh, that week before. And I did have to come home. I did have to spend uh, you know, a good chunk of time yesterday kind of um, ironing out some of the details. But someone told me, well, you don't need to prepare. Just get up there and the Holy Spirit will speak through you in that moment. And I get kind of offended by that when people say that you don't need to prepare. Because let me tell you, the Holy Spirit works in preparation. I was able to the week, but even before I went on vacation, um, to carve out a little bit of time that week um, to pray through what God wanted to say today. The Holy Spirit works last week for what happens today. And the reason we know that God doesn't just work in the moment is because, because God is God, because he's all-knowing, and he knows what Cross Community Church needed to hear June 27th at the 11 a.m. service, not only the week before, but from the beginning of time. And so be assured when at Cross Community, I think sometimes uh, Baptists get a bad rap for our interactions with the Holy Spirit. And I understand, I think there's uh, some good criticism there, but let me tell you, our pastors, our leaders here, um, we love the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we allow him to work in us. When we prepare a message, we don't preach from our own thoughts, our own opinions, our own power, but we seek the Holy Spirit as he works in us to share with us what our congregation needs to hear. So rest assured this morning, um, I'm preaching from what God, what I feel like God has led me to preach about today, and I'm really glad to do that. So we're in this series called Uncommon, and we are called to live uncommon lives from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Um, Timothy tells us to live uncommon lives in five different areas, in love, in speech, in purity, in conduct, and in faith. And specifically this morning, we're going to talk about what it looks like to live out an uncommon life of faith. But first, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Paul tells Timothy, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Now, the specific context that Paul is telling you, Timothy, is, is he's asking him to be ex an example for other believers. But the, the same truth is here, that as we set an example for other believers, we in turn set an example for the world of what it looks like for Christians to have an uncommon faith and uncommon lives. Because far too often, Christians look at the world and they see nothing special. About, or, uh, I'm sorry. All too common, the world looks at Christians and they see that, that we live just like everyone else. But we're not called to live that way. And this morning I wanted to tell you, this whole idea, this whole series is, is about the uncommon life. It's about the example that we set. And I want to share with you the, the power of example this morning with just a, a short couple of stories. But um, I always like to kind of delve into my life a little bit, let you know who I am as, as, a, as a man, as a husband, as a, a leader of this church. But I grew up in Van Buren, Arkansas, not too far from here. And our family grew up in church. Now, we were there Sunday morning. We were there Sunday night. For Wednesday night youth and children's programs, we were going to be there. If our church had Tuesday night visitation, our family was going to be there. If the doors were open and something was going on at the church, our family was going to be there. My parents always set a good example of what it meant to be committed to the church, even from a young age. But I knew that being a Christian was more than what happened within the walls of a church. You see, I'm not an early riser, and 
Uh, I don't like to wake up early. But oftentimes, if I would wake up early enough, if whatever was going on, I woke up, I don't know, couldn't sleep, I don't know. If I would wake up early enough, I would walk in, I would see my dad sitting in the recliner, eating his bowl of total, which is gross cereal, by the way. Why would anyone eat that? Um, he would eat his bowl of total, drink his coffee, and he would read his Bible. And it, it set an example for me, even from a young age, that the faith that we live out is bigger than what just happens in the church. It affects every part of our lives. It's a daily faith. It's a daily relationship that we live out. Um, another really good example that my parents set for me was how important it was to give to the church. We knew my brother and I knew that our parents tithed religiously, regularly, all the time to the church. And we knew that sometimes that giving hurt. Sometimes it meant maybe we didn't get to wear the clothes that we wanted to wear. Maybe sometimes if we wanted to go out to eat, we didn't have enough money. But you know what never was cut from our, our household? The money that we gave to the church. The example that my parents gave us for tithing showed me that faith was more than just what happens within the four walls of a building. Faith is a relationship with God that invades every part of our life every day. It causes us to, uh, to sacrifice. It causes us sometimes to go without. It causes us sometimes to suffer. But the way that we live out our faith is a beautiful thing. It's the best way to live our life. And, and I had a great example of that growing up. The example that we set has a ripple effect on those around us. As believers, we have a responsibility to show a lost and dying world the hope we have in Christ. As believers, we have a responsibility to set an example for each other. Why? Because faith is hard, yet powerful and profitable. And this morning, I'm going to do something that's a little bit out of my comfort zone, a little bit different for me as a, as a preacher. I'm going to look at a great example that we have of faith that's found in Scripture we're going to look at the faith of this one man and learn from his example this morning. So faith is hard. Faith is hard because it requires us to believe in something that we have not physically witnessed. Hebrews 11 verse 1 defines faith as the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. Again, Hebrews 11 says that faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. We get our definition of faith not from the world but from Scripture itself. Faith is whenever we realize that not only is Jesus king, not only is he Lord, but it affects the way that we live our lives. Faith is more than just belief. Faith is the example that we set. Faith is our ability to be obedient in every way to Christ. Faith invades every part of our lives. True faith sets us apart and leads us, again, to lead an uncommon life. And I don't know if you've looked at the numbers, but the church in America is on a decline. Every day, people walk away from the faith. They choose not to attend the local church. They fill their Sundays with rest and leisurely activities. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, here we are on a Sunday morning, um, preaching about the people that aren't even here. Um, but the issue is all too real. Um, one of the best things I ever heard about this, I was at a conference and J.D. Greer was speaking. And he said to a church full of pastors and leaders that the churches in America are fighting for an ever-shrinking piece of the pie. He said that the churches in America are fighting for an ever-shrinking piece of the Christian pie. The church is shrinking. It's sad, but it's a, it's a real reality that we have. However, um, authentic faith is becoming increasingly rare, but I'm not here to fix all the church's complex issues, but to spur us on toward faith. In the face of decreasing faith, the God of the universe still exists. The church, although diminished in size, will not be defeated, and Jesus is still at work in the brokenness that surrounds us. Jesus is not averse or inexperienced at wading through the brokenness of human life. And this morning, we want to look at a candidate for unlikely faith. Let me tell you about this man. Let me tell you about this guy who is, who's from the Bible, whose experience in life we get to learn from this morning. Um, he grew up in a religious family. 
again, um, it wasn't Christianity at the time. It was Judaism. But he grew up in a Jewish family. Basically, if the doors of the temple were open, they were there. If they were doing Tuesday night visitation at the temple, which I have no idea if they did that whatsoever, um, their family was going to be there. They were not a uh, loosely connected family to their faith and, in, and to their temple. Um, many people would have looked at them and would have said that they were radical, that they truly believed in God, that they truly lived their life to serve him, to walk in him. So this guy was a brother. He was, um, he was a man who grew up in this family, but, but not only his, was his family religious, um, this guy was a guy who grew up in the shadow of his older brother. I don't know if you've ever, um, I don't know if you have brothers or, or sisters, if you have an older one, but have you ever been in a family where, like, the eldest brother can do no wrong? You know, like, they're the perfect one, they're the, they're the child that was the example, and they're the measure by which every other child is measured. And, you know, I was that child, I was the perfect child, you know. Um, I had it all together for sure. Um, I didn't. You've, if you've heard my story, if you've heard me preaching very often, you know I've, I've had my fair share of brokenness in my life. Um, but uh, this guy was that guy in this family. Um, this, this, um, this guy that we're talking about had a brother who was that example, who was the shining star of the family, you know, who, was, who had the brother that could do no wrong. And I wonder, I wonder if this guy, growing up in a family like this, I wonder what he felt. Like, was he jealous? Was he jealous of his older brother? Was he mad? Was he mad at his parents for not understanding why, you know, so much attention and um, everything was focused on this older brother? Scripture doesn't tell us what he was feeling. It just tells us how he grew up. Um, even when he did something that maybe he thought was wrong, uh, the brother got away with it, essentially. Uh, scripture tells us. This man I'm talking about, um, his name is James. And James was the half-brother of Jesus. So I wonder how James, growing up, felt about Jesus. Scripture, whenever it talks about Jesus' half-brothers and sisters, it always lists James first, which probably meant that he was the second oldest child. He oftentimes, I wonder if he felt second in place to Jesus growing up. I wonder if he didn't understand. <clears throat> I wonder if he had um, harbored feelings of, of anger, again, of jealousy. I wonder how that affected his childhood. See, everyone could not stop ooing and awing over how awesome his brother was. In fact, all of his siblings grew up in the shadow of their older brother. He grew up in the Middle East in Israel nearly 2,000 years ago. So growing up with a, a superstar brother, again, we wonder... Was he ever excited for him? Um, there's all kinds of these crazy stories um, but we, that um, we don't know, but we, we know that eventually, right, Jesus grows up. He starts his own ministry. People begin to follow him. And James and his brothers begin to hear odd things about their brother Jesus. Again, this man who, or they're wondering, like, he's teaching? Or he get the authority to do so? We grew up in a family of carpenters. We're just blue-collar workers working away. Like, where did Jesus even get this from? Is he making it up? One time his mother comes back. We don't know if James was present at this wedding, but, but his mother Mary comes back and she says, James, listen, this incredible thing happened at this wedding. We were there. Now, weddings aren't, didn't look then like they look today. They weren't just a couple of hours. Um, they were all day, multiple. Uh, possibly, depending on how wealthy the family was, multiple day affairs of celebration. Well, at this specific wedding that Jesus, some of his disciples, and Mary went to, they ended up running out of wine too soon. In other words, it was a signal that the party was over. But, but Scripture tells us that Mary looks at Jesus, and she says, Jesus, are you going to do something about that? Jesus looks back at Mary. He says, woman, um, first of all, if I called my mother woman, I would expect like a slap in the face or something. But Jesus says to his mother Mary, he says, woman, my time has not yet come. However, um, tell the servants to come here. So the servants came over. He said, 
servants take these huge, like, jugs, basically, uh, down to the water, fill them with water, come back and present that to the leaders of this wedding, to the, to the bride and the groom and to the father of the bride. Um, they take the jars with water to him. He dips a cup in, and he drinks the best wine that he had ever had. In fact, it's so good that they're saying, hey, you're supposed to bring out the good wine at the beginning. Where was this the whole time? And Mary's telling James, listen, your brother turned the water into wine. And I can't help but wonder, was James skeptical? Like, this is an incredible story. This is an unbelievable story. This is a miraculous story. Was James skeptical? Was he thinking, you guys are crazy. Like, I don't know where the wine came from, but you can't turn water into wine. Like, we live in a society where we need proof for everything. Like, when we hear a truth proclaimed, we immediately begin to wonder, where's the twist? Where's the twist in it? What is the real truth that's hidden behind what we just heard? If we see video footage, we wonder, is the video doctored? Is it edited carefully to, to just show what, we wanna, what they want to show us? If we see a picture, we wonder, hey, is that picture edited? So I can't help but think that James must have been skeptical at his brother. James must have not believed that Jesus really had done all these, true, all these crazy things, and it went on. Uh, James heard about how Jesus would give sight to the blind, how he would make the mute speak. Lame men walked. All manner of fantastic things were said about his brother. How could he not help but feel skeptical, wondering where this came from? After all, he grew up with Jesus. He knew him from childhood. John chapter 7, verse 1 through 5 paints a really cool picture um, and kind of gives us some insight to where James was, how he really did feel about his brother. Now, this would have been, uh, just just to give just a little bit of context, John chapter 7 would have been within the last probably six months of Jesus' ministry. So he'd heard all these things. He'd seen all these things. He'd heard about the water turned into wine. And James 7 paints this picture. It says, After these things, and this should be on the screen too. Yes, perfect. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee. For he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was near. So his brother said to him, move on from here and go into Judea so that your disciples may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself is striving to be known publicly. If you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. And then it says in verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. We know that when his brothers were faced with the miraculous and crazy things that they heard about their brother Jesus, that James and his other brothers simply did not believe. In fact, they're kind of making fun of him a little bit. They're saying, you're just doing this for publicity. Go do it in the public. They didn't believe him. We knew that James did not walk in faith. He did not believe the things that people were saying about his brother. As people were saying that Jesus was the Messiah, James was saying, I don't think so. I knew him. I grew up with with him. It's too fantastic to believe. Yeah, I can't explain all the stuff you've seen. I can't explain all these things. But I cannot yet believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So Jesus continued on in his ministry and spoke about his kingdom. His kingdom was eternal and not of this world. And just to give you a little bit of context, since the Jews at the time of, uh, that Jesus was walking and ministering on the earth, the Jews were always looking out for a Messiah. There were several times where, where people would rise up, claim to be the Messiah, and it turned out to be uh, false. What the Jewish people were looking for was a Messiah who would come as a physical king on this earth that would liberate them from the, from the uh, suppression and from the, uh, to them, torment of being under the Roman authority and under the Roman Empire and would set up Israel as a, a sovereign nation again and would bring about his kingdom physically on the earth. But what Jesus spoke about was not a kingdom that was physical and on, here on this earth. It was a kingdom that transcended this earth. He spoke about a kingdom that was in heaven. He spoke about a kingdom that was here and that was bigger than their small minds could even conceive. 
And so I can't help but wonder, as Jesus spoke about being the king in this kingdom, if James was just thinking, no, nah, I've seen this. People have come and gone. Here my brother is claiming to be something he is not. Finally, the Jewish leaders and the people had had enough of Jesus and his teachings, and he had rocked the boat too much. They decided that Jesus was not the Messiah, and they carefully laid plans to brutally crucify him and to silence him once and for all. They succeeded. The Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, the Roman authorities all came together they crucified Jesus on the cross. And it's apparent that James knew Jesus was dead. And I wonder, how did James feel? Was he bittersweet? Was it a, uh, you know, he claimed to be something he wasn't. He kind of got what was coming to him. Yet, was he sad? Because yet this is his brother. And you know that there had to be some brotherly affection in there. Was, was James thinking, yeah, he might have been crazy, but he didn't deserve death. We knew that at this point yet, James had no faith. I wonder if James was mad at Jesus. Let me tell you why. Um, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, suffering, he looks down, his mother is there. Uh, apparently, James and his brothers weren't present for the actual crucifixion. Jesus looks at his disciple, John. He says, John, look at Mary, my mother. Mary, look at John. He said, man, this is your mother, and mother, this is your son. In effect, he was giving his mother into John's care because Jesus knew that his time was coming to an end. But think about it. If James is the older brother, shouldn't Mary have been given into his care? Like, Was he mad at Jesus because Jesus took away an honor and a privilege and a responsibility that he had? Like, We don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us in that moment. We just know what happens, and we can kind of confer and, and kind of even dream just a little bit about what might have been. But something crazy happens next. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 7. Now, James knows his brother is dead. So Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. Do we have this on the screen? There we go. For I handed down to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. Jesus, upon his resurrection, upon him overcoming death and sin on our behalf, Jesus has an encounter with his brother, James. James knew his brother had died, yet what he saw standing before him defied all logic. He could see the, the holes in his wrists, the holes in his feet. He, he could possibly even see the the place where the spear had pierced Jesus in his side. It defied all logic. And what we know from what Scripture tells us about James from here on is that James placed his faith in Christ. I find this to be an incredible truth that should change the way that we look at faith. Let me tell you why. I have a brother. Um, he's three years younger than me. I grew up with him my whole life. Um, we have a, a great relationship to this day. But listen, if my brother claimed to be something that he is not, I have the proof of my whole experience and my whole life with me. I can testify that, that my brother is not the Messiah. If he claims to be God, I can point back to all the dumb things that he had done growing up, right? And he can point back to me. If I claim to be something that I'm not, he can say, listen, I grew up with you. You've made your fair share of mistakes. But listen, James grew up with Jesus. He knew everything he had ever done. And yet he could not find fault anywhere in his life. 
And even though fantastic things were being said about them, he was now faced with the reality that his dead brother has now been resurrected. And he had no choice but to place his faith in his brother and to realize that his brother was not just a man who lived on this earth, that his brother was the king, that his brother was the Lord, that his brother was God in the flesh. I can't be, help but be moved by the faith with which James has. If there's any man in the entire history of the world that could call out Jesus for a lie, it would have been James. It would have been his family. Yet James goes on to be one of the great founders of our faith and one of the great leaders in the church. His story goes on. Listen to the life that James lived and the example of faith that he gives us. So when he later writes the epistle of James, so we're going to read from that here in just a little bit. If you want to open up your book, um, your Bible, or your app to the book of James, um, we're going to be reading from the book of James here in just a little bit. But uh, the book of James was written by none other than the half-brother of Jesus. He identifies himself not as the brother of Jesus or leader of the church, but simply James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's in James chapter 1, verse 1. Immediately after Jesus ascends to heaven, we're going to be kind of running through these um, real quick, some of these scripture references, but in Acts 1, 14, James find, or, uh, Acts 1, chapter 14 finds James with the apostles praying and waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. James is one of the, holy, is one of the 120 filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the day the church begins. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, from the moment he encounters Jesus, the risen Lord, James is wholeheartedly devoted to serving him and his church. Less than 10 years later, when Paul visits Jerusalem, he meets with two church elders, Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. When Paul describes this event in Galatians 1, 18 through 19, he refers to James as the apostle one of the select few who had witnessed the risen Christ and whose teaching held authority. James is still head of the church at Jerusalem 14 years later when Paul returns to settle the issue of which Jewish laws apply to Gentile believers. So this is incredible. James not only lived out authentic faith in Christ, he not only lived an uncommon life, but he became the leader of the entire church in Jerusalem. And he was not one to mince words. He help them whenever they had problems in the church because the church wasn't perfect. When recounting the story of the Jerusalem council in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, Paul describes James as a pillar of the church, a man of high reputation. He also records that when James and the other elders approved his ministry to the Gentiles, the one thing they asked was that he remember the poor. I love this about James. James was a radical advocate and spoke often about the social inequality that was in the world. It's a passion for James, who repeatedly demands justice for the poor in the epistle of James. About a quarter of the book is devoted to advocating for and encouraging the needy, condemning favoritism based on wealth, and confronting the rich about their greed, apathy, exploitation, and foolish pride. The only other person in the New Testament who talks this much about social inequality is Jesus himself. What a beautiful life that, that James lived. What a great example of faith that he set for us. What a great example of what it looks like to live an uncommon life. Everything we've spoken about James is backed up in the scripture thus far. I kind of wanted to um, delve from what is maybe traditional for preaching, but kind of delve into what church history tells us um, about James and what people wrote even in the second century about him. So scripture does not record the death of James. The book of Acts, a chronological accounting of the history of the early church, ends with Paul in house arrest in Rome, and James is likely still alive and leading the church at Jerusalem. The historian Josephus places James' death during a time of transition between two Roman governors, signifying a probable date of 62 AD. Now, again, this is not in Scripture. This is just what other historians and other people are writing about James and um, that we can look back on. 
But listen to this. This is incredible. The same historian writes, it says, by this time, James has earned himself some nicknames. James the Just. Oblias, a Greek word meaning bulwark of the people. And this one's uh, my personal favorite. An old camel knees. They called James old camel knees. Why old camel knees? So Matt Erickson writes that a second century Christian wrote that James was often found alone in the temple on his knees begging for God to forgive the Jews and that he spent so much time on his knees in prayer that they became hard like those of a camel. James spent so much time on his knees praying that he literally developed calluses on his knees, praying for his brothers, praying for his sisters, praying for their salvation. His life bore evidence that he believed what he wrote about prayer in James chapter 5, 16, which is a huge verse in our recovery ministry that says, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. James believed that his faith would soon be put to the test. Again, this is not found in scripture, but is written by early theologians and church leaders of the time, um, as early as the second century. But one writes the following about James' death as quoted by one of the 4th century church historians. It says, James the just is so well respected by even the non-Christian Jews that when James tells them Jesus is the Savior, some of the ruling class become believers. This worries the Jewish leaders who beg James to speak to the crowds. The Jewish leaders take James to the summit of the temple where the crowd can see and hear him and cry out in a loud voice, We are all bound to obey you as you are just. The people are confused and following the dead man named Jesus. Tell us about this crucified Jesus. So the Jewish leaders are saying, listen, the people respect you. You're James the just. And they're insisting on worshiping and following this man that we crucified named Jesus. They're like, James, come on, man, tell them the truth. And here's what James says. It says, James calls out just as loudly, why do you ask me about Jesus? Again, he was the half-brother. He knew him his entire life. He said, he sits in heaven at the right hand of God and will return on the clouds of heaven. Many of the people are convinced then and there that Jesus is the resurrected Lord and start praising him on the spot. What an incredible testimony. It says the leaders are beside themselves. They shout to the people, oh dear, the just man is confused himself and throw James down from that height, but he is not killed. So the leaders start stoning him, which is a, a common, uh, common approach for, for death in that day to many people. And many believers um, endured a stoning of, of death, even Stephen in the book of Acts. James does what he's always done. He kneels down and asks God to forgive the Jews. The stones continue to batter his body as the priest yells, Stop! What are you doing? The just one is praying for us. A launderer takes the club used to beat clothes and hurls it at James' head, and the just one finally dies. James gave his life for his faith. I find that so incredible. Two, another really powerful apologetic. If you don't know what apologetics are, apologetics are just reasons for faith. And what I find so beautiful about faith is that faith is reasonable. It's not provable. We can't physically quantify that there is a God. We can't physically go back 2,000 years and verify that Jesus did, in fact, die on the cross. But what we have in the Bible is reliable. We have reasons for that. We have reasons for faith. We see it written on the hearts and the minds of men and women, of Christians throughout the ages who have given their life for a cause that defies all logic. Faith is at least reasonable. That's all what apologetics is about. And what I find so incredible is that no one gives their life for what they know is a lie. They may tell a lie. They may be claim to, to be something they're not, but when it comes down to it, they don't give their life for what they know is a lie. James knew in his heart that his brother Jesus was the Messiah. He knew that he had been resurrected. He had true and authentic faith. He gave his life for the truth. I found that incredible. 
of all the people that should have not had faith, it should have been James. Yet James placed his faith in his brother Jesus. Again, James knew that Jesus was king, that he was the Lord, that he was sitting in the right hand at the head of his kingdom, and that he was the God in the flesh. What a powerful example that James sets for us. What a powerful example that should spur us on to faith, that should spur us on to living that uncommon life. When people look at us, they should not see Christians who just come to church and who are just content for checking off a box for a Sunday morning. They see people whose faith infiltrates every part of their lives. They see people who live out authentic faith. I wanted to end today um, just with a few points from James's writings. A few things that James has to say about faith. This is found in James chapter 1. First point should be up there. Is that faith, there we go, faith needs to grow. Faith needs to grow. So James writes in James chapter 1, verse 1. He says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James says trials and tribulations are coming. Problems are going to happen. Every day we we live in a society where faith is becoming, according to Facebook, according to uh, the people that are around us, according to politicians, I mean, you've probably heard it, that faith is unreasonable, that Christians are the ones who are narrow-minded, that Christians are the ones who are backwards. There's reasons every day out there that try to point us away from faith. But James says, listen, you're going to encounter trials. You're going to encounter tribulations. And as you continue to place your faith in Christ, that perseverance works itself out in you that you may be, may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Our faith has to grow. As our faith is tested, if it's not growing, it's dying. The second point that James makes is that faith without works is dead. I love this. Faith without works is dead. In James chapter 2, verse 14, James writes, he says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled. In other words, you might have heard this, Hey, our thoughts and prayers are are with you. We're not actually going to do anything, though. He says, And you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. I'm not here to say that we shouldn't pray for people, that our thoughts and our prayers shouldn't go out to people, but that faith necessitates action. Faith without works is dead. In other words, if you say you have faith, if you say you have belief, you believe all these things about Jesus, you believe that he was resurrected, you believe that his kingdom is a reality, you believe that your hope is in heaven, yet it doesn't affect the way that you live your life, then that faith is dead. Not that we're saved by works, and that's a whole other sermon for a a whole other time, but that uh, faith is proven by our works. Faith is proven by the way that we live our life. It's proven by our works. I love this quote. It says, regarding the debate about faith and works, C.S. Lewis says, It's like asking which blade in a pair of scissors is most important. They're both necessary. Faith and works are necessary. The third point that uh, James makes is that faith is more than just belief. James 2.19 says, You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. James says that faith is more than just belief. You believe that Jesus is real, good for you, basically. Satan believes, the demons believe, yet they don't have faith that saves. Faith without works is dead. 
Faith is more than just belief. It's the way that we live out our life. It's something that infiltrates every part of our hearts, of our minds. It's more than just what happens on a Sunday morning in these four walls. It's, it's daily. It's a relationship with Christ. It's hope in something that we cannot see. It's works. It's the way that we live our lives. Faith is living out our relationship with Christ. I kind of wanted to end today. I know I'm going a little bit long, but I kind of want to end today by, again, telling you about the power of example. Many of us know Gandhi. He won a Nobel Peace Prize. He was regarded as many as a, um, maybe an example of peace. He spoke a lot about faith. Um, he spoke a lot about, uh, he was a pacifist. Um, Gandhi was a Hindu. Yet Gandhi had interactions with Christianity. Now we know as believers, what saves us is not faith in just God alone, but it's knowledge that God sent his son Jesus, that he died on the cross, and it's faith through Christ, and it's exclusive to the blood that Christ shed on the cross for us. That's a really important distinction to make this morning. Gandhi, although considered a good man by many, without faith in Christ, does not get to live the life that Christ has for him, does not get to be with Christ in heaven. But Gandhi did have some really interesting interactions with Christians. Um, he, this is one of those stories, too, that I've heard this story before, and I, sometimes if you look, you know, like you go look up what a preacher says, you realize it's like a complete fabrication just to make a great point. Like that does happen. And, uh, but I looked this up, I, I verified this, and I looked at a little bit of the life of, of Gandhi, and it says that Christianity intrigued him. Um, once he was around Christians who encouraged him to read the Bible, and he did. He read the entire Bible. Um, he didn't like some of what the Old Testament said. Um, God was too mean. Um, but he loved Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. Yet he could never give himself over to faith that Christ was, in fact, the Messiah. He only regarded Christ as a good teacher, which we know you cannot be a good teacher if you claim to be God. And... Uh, the Reverend Pattison tells us the following story. One Sunday morning, Gandhi decided that he would visit one of the Christian churches in Calcutta. Upon seeking entrance to the church sanctuary, he was stopped at the door by the ushers. He was told he was not welcome, nor would he be permitted to attend this particular church as it was for high caste Indians and whites only. He was neither high caste nor was he white. Because of the rejection, the Mahatma turned his back on Christianity. And with this act, Gandhi rejected the Christian faith, never again to consider the claims of Christ. He was turned off by the sin of segregation that was practiced by the church. And it was due to this experience that Gandhi later declared, and I quote, I'd be a Christian if it were not for the Christians. I would be a Christian if it were not for the Christians. Listen to the power of example. Like Example can be good. Example is, is like, you know, as iron sharpens iron, so um, one man sharpens another. As faith sharpens faith, as we run into people with faith, it encourages our faith and it grows our faith. But if we as believers lead these types of examples that push away other people from faith, we have the power to push away people from Christ. And I pray that that would never be for us. I pray that as people walk into cross community, that they are welcome, um, that they are welcome with open arms. No matter their lifestyles, no matter the problems that they have, no matter the sin that we perceive them to have in their life, that people walk into cross community, that they are met with love, unconditional love. That they are met with the gospel, the life-changing truth that Jesus He's the king. He's the Lord. He gave his life. He died on the cross. He was resurrected, and only in him is our hope. I pray that we allow Jesus to change their life by the truth. Yes, sin is sin, but it's the Holy Spirit and it's the work of him in our hearts and our lives that roots out the sin that's in our lives. Our job is to share the gospel. Our job is to accept. Our job is to point to the uh, is to point them to Christ. It's Jesus's job and it's the Holy Spirit's job to change us from the inside out. 
I pray that as believers that we live uncommon lives, that people look at the way we live and they want to, to be a part of that. That they realize that we're not just like everyone else in the world. That Christians are kind. That Christians are loving. That Christians speak truth and, that they, and even that we don't, uh, we don't follow the whims of culture, even when they say that we're full of hate, but we don't speak in a hateful tone. Yes, we are committed to the truth. Our truth comes from the scripture, it comes from God himself. But we proclaim that truth with kindness and love in our hearts to a lost and a dying world. I pray that cross community lives lives of uncommon faith. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for everyone that is here this morning. And, and Father, I pray that we would be spurred on to authentic faith because we see James and we see his story. We see how unlikely his faith was, how uncommon his faith was. And Father God, I pray that we are encouraged by that this morning. God, I pray that the people of Cross Community um, would be people who live out true and authentic faith would be people that live out uncommon lives. God, I pray that we set that example for each other. God, I pray that we set that example for the world around us. God, would you use us? Give us opportunities to share the gospel. Give us opportunities to be the light and to be the source of hope in this broken and hopeless world. God, I pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.